I'm Nate. I'm Noah. And this is the third Chats episode of Talking Lion. This is more or less where we're breaking down our week and our life uh, outside of all of the artist interviews that we're doing. Not only are we breaking down the week, now we're just breaking our own structure because originally we were going to put these out in between artist episodes. But in this quarantine, to our surprise, we have gotten more interviews than we expected. And there have been more milestones for the artists that we have been interviewing. So we're changing our schedule a little bit. This is probably going to come out on a Wednesday. So you're just going to get more of us. And there might even be other stuff. There might be Gaming Lion. Who knows? Who knows? So there's just going to be a lot of us. And if you're whether not sick you of- Whether you ask for it or not. Whether you ask for it or not. But if you happen to ask for it, you're in luck. Because there's a lot. And if you really, really like us, we have a Patreon. That's patreon.com slash talking lion. And if you subscribe, there are a bunch of rewards. You could even be on this show. You well, might even get art with your face. There's all kinds of stuff. So check that out. Not only will you be supporting the show, but you'll be supporting the community. Because we pledge half of whatever we make on Patreon goes directly towards other artists. And the other half goes towards keeping this thing afloat. So go to Patreon. And uh, without further ado, this is Talking Lion. I'm Noah, and this is Talking Lion. <laughs> My name is Business Fish, and this is Talking Lion. I like that. Yeah. Do you remember what Business Fish actually came from? Peter. No, it was a Facebook sticker set. Oh, remember right. Those? It, like, was, remember, it was the... It was the. It was a fish in a suit. Well, okay, for some context, Business Fish was like... Because when we first started Sleeping Lion... You had a you had a like a solo project called Business Fish. Yeah, spelled really pretentiously, B Z N Z Fish, yeah. just so that the, it would be the same number of characters, so it would look cool on a logo. I remember you did a James Vincent McMorrow cover. Yeah, that, that wasn't really under Business Fish. Business Fish was supposed to be like an all instrumental electronic project. You had a whole eight oh eight. Tribute. Yeah, that was probably the coolest thing I ever did with it was on 808, at 808 on SoundCloud, I posted a track made exclusively from an 808 drum kit. We were on samples. some like pretentious like audio nerd shit at that time though. Remember I wanted to make a record that was four seconds long and you yeah. had to like, each song would be the the time it was supposed to be. Like that was the title. Like a song would be 310, but it'd be one second and you had to like elongate it out. But it also just wouldn't have worked. I wanted it to work, yeah. but it wouldn't have worked. Could it have worked? Maybe. Maybe. We have the technology. We have the technology, but I'm glad we didn't do that. Instead, we made easily digestible pop music. Yes. Well, sort of se- semi-easily. Semi, semi-digestible semi pop music. We It is digestible to exactly the people who are deciding to eat it. Eat it? Digest eat it. it. Please eat our music. Please eat our music. So we can eat real food. <laughs> <laughs> so every week, we ask each other, a series of questions. And this way we can just sort of catch up on uh, our weeks. Take it away, Scotty. It's not my name, bud. Uh, <laughs> We've been roommates for five years. What's the difference anymore? What is my name? I want to say it's Norbert. <laughs> I hate that. <laughs> All right. Starting up. What is something new and something old you're listening to? Um, something new I've been listening to. Our, our lovely friend Pepper Lewis asked me to listen to the new Fiona Apple record and to see what I thought of it. And it's weird and it's crazy, but it sounds really cool. It sounds like a junkyard. Like there's a lot of like, <laughs> like percussion that sounds like pots and pans and stuff. And the piano works really cool. And her lyrics are really out there and like aggressive and really mature and she's just really compelling as a vocalist and it's a really strange record I don't know how I feel about it I think that's I like the thing it. like I don't I kind of skimmed through the record I like I thought it was interesting and cool I've never necessarily been a Fiona Apple fan even in my like weirder folk gear days yeah I never really got into her I never like sat down and listened to a Fiona Apple album before this and I don't think this is the record to get into her necessarily yeah. like I don't know. If I go back, go on a kick, understand the appeal, I imagine this record would yeah. be. Because I know people are freaking out about this record. Yeah. I just, just didn't necessarily have that experience. I'm not right or wrong or like whatever. It just didn't happen. It didn't hit me the way. Yeah, it didn't It didn't blow me away. But I did, there, there were moments that really like tickled my fancy. 
I will say. What is your, what is the old thing? What is the old thing I've been listening to? There's an Oscar Peterson, the jazz piano player record. It's Buddy DeFranco and Oscar Peterson played George Gershwin. It's, it's a, it's a record of crazy piano and clarinet and it's all Gershwin songs. I found it because there's a, they did an arrangement of It Ain't Necessarily So from I think Porgy and Bess. And it's just so like pretty. And the strings are, the strings are like really film scory and cinematic and it's just this nice like mix of like big band shit and like re- really pretty string arrangements and like crazy piano playing and crazy clarinet playing. And I don't know why I've I've gotten so into it, but it's just an, a record that I really like from 1954. I think my new is our friend's loot put out a record called Heart Eyes and it is awesome. Um there's just like some really great songs on there, but my favorite song on the record is a song called Sex With My Ex. Oh, so and good. it's just such a good song. Actually, I remember they played the demo when they came by to record their episode with us. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, Travis Barker's on it, Captain Cuts is on it, but there's also this artist on it called Home Alone. And Home Alone put out a record that same week called Better Off No Thanks to You Part One. And it's awesome. There are two songs on it uh, specifically, Hate Me and I Don't Trust Anyone that I just have been listening to on repeat. It is so good. I am like, I don't know, there's this like pop punk like element to it that I really enjoy, but there's also just like this, I don't know, just really candid intensity. Like it just, it just like dives in exactly where it needs to dive in. And I just, I just really appreciate that. Not to mention that I appreciate any anonymous project where the, the main figure is a drunk Stuffed rabbit cartoon. Yeah. So check out, yeah, check out Loot, obviously, and check out Home Alone, too. Home Alone. No affiliation to the Macaulay Culkin movie. No affiliation. But you feel heard and seen in the same way that I imagine a lot of kids who watched Home Alone, myself included, felt. That was my, that was uh, related. It was yeah. loosely linked. As for the old thing that I'm listening to, I didn't go quite as like far back as Oscar Peterson. Yeah. But last year, this band called Cara Cara put out an EP called Better. I have been a fan. So Will Lindsay is like the lead singer of Cara Cara. It's a band out of Philly. And before Will Lindsay had a project called WC Lindsay that I like grew up listening to. But this record, this Better EP has just like, each song has kind of had like a moment with me. Like there's Mm. been, you know, one song on the record that popped out and I'll listen to it for two months and then another song will pop yeah. out. So for me, this, I suppose, month, I don't know, but at least this week, I've been listening to a song called New Chemical Hades, pretty much on repeat. It's a really beautiful song. When I first listened to it, I kind of just brushed it off. But I don't know. For some reason, this song just like really hit me this week and I, I've i been listening to it pretty much on repeat. So shout out, Will, if you're listening, and uh, Cara Cara, because they... I, I just, are, I think they're incredible. And I think everybody who listens to this should just like get into them because they're super cool. Also, fun fact, Karakara is a type of bird. I don't know if that's the only thing that it is or if that's where the name comes from. But I was going through my list of birds by common name that I compiled and I, I saw Karakara on it. I'm like, that's funny that that's like, it's spelled the same way, like C-R-A, C-R-A. That probably makes sense. Like I, I imagine that's probably where it came from. Otherwise, it's just a very specific coincidence yeah you know we'll, we'll get them on here you know we'll, we'll we'll change our pop tune into something a little bit more rock uh, oriented <laughs> and i mean hey well Lindsay, well Lindsay knows how to put a chorus together he always does and that's the thing that totally fucks with me is that every song he makes is so like from a pop writing standpoint so good you know and it's but still is authentically i don't know rock or punk or like wherever they sort of sit genre wise but you said a cool thing about birds Yes. What is something else you learned this week? I just listened to a podcast that was a rerun of another podcast. It was it was a 99 percent. So this is a rehash of a rehash. This is this is a <laughs> this is a uh, yeah. This is me giving information that was transmitted from one podcast that was taken promoting another podcast. The podcast is ninety nine percent invisible. This is dethawed refried beans. Yeah, this is literally dethawed refried beans of of a fun fact, which was a rehash of information I heard on another podcast many years ago. So this is not the, the freshest of information. This is refried beans that were also somewhere else many years ago. Is but, this a hit HBO show? Because this is definitely the leftovers. Yeah, it, this this is some leftovers. But if you if you 
for whatever reason, haven't stumbled upon this piece of history, this wonderful piece of gaming history. The, the thing was an interview with the guy who, I forget his name, the guy who made the E.T. game for Atari. And it was just it's just really interesting because it, this is notoriously one of the worst video games of all time. It was critically panned. People hated it. And it was so bad that they that all of the stores chucked their unsold inventory back to Atari and Atari in just a weird move of frustration, buried a bunch of them in the desert because they didn't know what else to do with them. <laughs> and it kind of tanked the uh, uh, the company and also was kind of a, the E.T. game became a symbol for the the failing of that era of the game industry, like the demise of the gaming industry. And like the movie tie-ins. And the movie, yeah, and movie tie-ins. But just listening to the guy, because because it was literally back back in that time, you one person could develop an entire game for a large company like that. And there was this guy. They hit him up in July and were like, hey, you're the guy. You've done really well with, with stuff in the past. Like, can you put together this game for, for E.T.? It's a smash hit. We got to have it in stores by December. Or we got to have it in stores by December, but we need the game done by September. That gives you five weeks and one day to finish <laughs> this game. And he was like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And he worked on it every day. He literally d- devised a strategy to like, he would work on it until he got stuck and then fall asleep and try to solve the problem in his dreams. Like he literally devoted every hour of his life to putting this game together and he delivered it. And they were like, good job. Like you did it. Like they had no idea. There was no QA or. Yeah, there was no QA. Like they, they also, I think they didn't even know that they were putting them under a ton of pressure. They just, they were just looking at the timeline of the year. Like, all right, movie came out, was a big hit. Like it needs to be in, in stores before Christmas because that's when everyone's going to buy it. And also, uh, it just took them a really long time to sign away the film rights. So it, it left them with almost no time. And the thing is, like, he, the way he talks about it, like, he knew it was a bad game, too. Like, he, he did the best he could. It just was impossible to make something uh, that was up to people's expectations. And also, because of, of how big that movie was, people's expectations were impossibly high. <laughs> so it was just, I don't know, it's such an... Well, and the other... So the podcast, within the podcast that... I stumbled upon was this podcast called Side Door, I want to say. Don't quote me on that. It's a podcast about like weird offbeat museum things. And the reason this was a podcast episode by Side Door was because a copy of the game that was buried in the desert uh, was unearthed by this person who works for the Smithsonian who was like a gaming nerd and like was like, this is an important piece of history, like American history and gaming history and entertainment history. So it's part of the Smithsonian collection. There's a there's a, a beat up, crusty v- dis or a, a, like whatever cartridge, cartridge of the ET game that was unearthed from a you know a landfill in the <laughs> desert and now is in the Smithsonian. I just think that's really cool, and it's just a funny. I don't know. It's just a really interesting piece of history that 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 speaks to the history of flops, like the history like, uh, of flops, the rumor, yeah. like all that stuff. What's funny is like. I think that guy was on This American Life on NPR. Yeah, that's a couple, probably where like a the couple of years yeah. ago. And I remember I was working, um, I was working for somebody in Boston. I was like picking up their kids. I was horribly depressed at the time, and so I was just driving, kind of just like in my feelings, very upset about like life at the time. And I was just listening to NPR because he didn't have an aux cord or anything. Mm-hmm. And and uh, so I was listening to NPR. I hear this guy. I remember like for a moment sitting with that story, like, huh. At least I'm not that guy. Yeah. (laughs) Like, but he he seemed like a nice guy. And it was, I think what was so sort of heartbreaking about it was like what kind of motivated him too was not just that he was like, you know, the sole person on this, like essentially at the time AAA project, but also that like Steven Spielberg was so excited about it. Yeah. And like like him recounting how excited (laughs) Steven Spielberg was about this video game. And that was like, I had to do it for Steven. Like that kind of, you know, I just remember. (laughs) <laughs> just remember, like, never meet your heroes, you yeah. know? No, before, the, in, in fact, before the game actually, before people realized that it was a terrible game, like, the fact that he got it done so fast, Steven Spielberg personally called him a genius. Like, this guy is a genius. Like, everything was going well. And, <laughs> no, one of my favorite parts of the story was he had no idea for a while that the game was doing really poorly until people around the office were like, hey, man, you really did the best you could. It's not your fault. And he, that's when he was like, wait, what's going on? What's not my fault? Like, yeah. what's, like, like, what wasn't my fault? Like, he, like, the game had been out for a while and all that. He called them the suits. We're like, yeah, man, like, don't worry. We don't blame you for this. And he was like, wait, what? What don't you blame <laughs> me for? Like, what's going on? So what is something cool that you've learned? Uh, we got into kind of an argument about it. It was less kind of like what I learned and more like 
an observation that now I think is like the hill I'm going to die on. Yeah. Compound words. Yeah. What's the deal with them? Yeah. What's the deal with them? You know that like throughout our songwriting life together, I have made compound words out of things that aren't necessarily compound words. Why? Part of it is an aesthetic quirk because I like when it looks different than every other version of it. But part of it is that I don't entirely understand how we came up upon compound words culturally. There are words that are compound words that are compound words for no reason. And this is where I'm I'm getting at. Bedroom is one word, compound yes. word. Because a bed is a bed and a room is a room, but a bedroom is a place where somebody in a house sleeps. So by putting the two words together, they become something new. And yet guest room, which functionally would do the same thing as a compound word, is not a compound word. It might be, though, because here's the other thing. I looked it up. It isn't. Guest room isn't, but mm-hmm. living room is. Living room is classified as a compound word. Is living room classified yeah. as a compound there, word? Because I, I looked it up, too. There are things called, th- there's three types of compound words. There's open, closed, and hyphenated. And open compound words are considered compound words, but there's a space between them. But they're still classified as a quote-unquote compound word. Uh, my issue is with open compound words. So you don't think they should exist? I think <laughs> that they sh- there should be a codified reason as to why they yeah, exist. Which I don't think which there is. There isn't. And I don't imagine that we're going to change that no, on our podcast. But it would be very nice. Because compound words obviously being when two words come together, they become a different thing. Yeah. Horseshoe. You know? But I, I do have an, an issue with how that works. Similarly, storyteller and storytelling are is a compound word, but storytell isn't. You know? Whoa. I never yeah. thought about that one. Yeah. You can't, yeah. You can't story tell. You can't story tell. Which I'm sure has some sort of Latin or Germanic or Anglo, whatever, reason. But I just, I think that if we're going to combine some words and not combine other words, because, we'll, you know, you can find living room in the dictionary. Like, yeah. it won't just be like living and room. You'll find living room in the dictionary. I just think if we're going to combine some compound words and not combine others, we should have a reason. You know, but you said while we were having the argument that like trying to have any kind of like consistency in English would be a nightmare. It, like, it's Im- almost impossible. But yeah. I just would like in this one space that there could be some consistency. Although, it, I, had, I was having this thought a couple days ago. While, while thinking about this. I'm happy that this lingered with you as much as it lingered with me. Yeah. <laughs> no, it really, it really has. Because I was I was thinking about vowels. Because I, uh, the, the, the consistency root main thing mainly may, makes me think about vowels. There's a really cool YouTube video where a guy goes through a paragraph of text and slowly locks all the vowels in English and makes it so there's only one way to pronounce every vowel in the English language. And, and he slowly chips away at all the weird edge cases and how he pronounce vowels and how he combine vowels in English. Uh, and more and more the language sounds like uh, something Scandinavian or something kind of like otherworldly or like Elvish or something. I only learned this. This is this is a cool thing that I learned. I only uh, recently in the last couple of months for a family friend of mine who speaks a bunch of languages was talking about Italian, and she just said, "Oh yeah, the vowels are just i e o u." And I was like, "That can't that can't be true. Like, there's no way that that every single word in the Italian language is pronounced i e o u." And then I went through in my head and tried to find an, an exception, and I couldn't. Italian is completely consistent in how they pronounce vowels. English is not at all. But here's here's what I'm getting to. I think that English is a wildly inconsistent language. It's a mess. It's got words from French. It's got words from Latin and German. It's got crazy combinations of letters. It's got it's got no consistency. It's it's a total. If you look at it on paper, the rule. It's one of the hardest languages to learn outside of languages like. Chinese that have like pictograph, like the, where you have to learn a whole other alphabet system just to get a point of entry into the language. It's really opaque in some ways on paper. But I think that's part of what makes it beautiful is that it's such a janky language. I think part of its utility is that it's really varied in, in how it's put together. Well, and that is, I was thinking about that the other day. I believe there's like 14 different vowel sounds. We have, we have A, E, I, O, U. We have five vowels and sometimes Y. <laughs> but uh, there are like 14 vowel sounds and combinations. Where we are inconsistent is how, you know, if you, if you put out, if you order these letters between consonants or like whatever, how are they reacting? That has been inconsistent. But what's interesting is that, you know, it's not like we're going outside of our 14, you know, sound spectrum. Yeah. That's something I was looking up when, you know, when it came to songwriting, because you have to know how certain, and, and what's funny, I was thinking, I was thinking specifically about Don't Like Me mm. and about how I don't like me either. 
you know, you've got three I rhymes going on. And that's why I wrote it, because I liked having that internal rhyme scheme going on. But I have also, in songs that we've written, either for us or for other people, I've used either. Yeah. When it works for me. There's no, like, reason as to why people do either or either. It's really? Is there, is there no... Not really. No. There's pretty much no reason as to why people say either or either, you know. And so I've been, you know, I use it. How it, if I need an I rhyme, there it is. Do I need an E rhyme? There it is. It's just one of those things, you know, where I guess on the one hand I'm arguing about inconsistency on the other on on one side, and benefiting from inconsistency on the other. But it's it's also it's interesting because it's just the thing with compound words is at a certain point a compound word like two two words that mean something different but are put together. Are still like living room is still classified as a compound yeah, word. Yeah, and it's an inconsequential argument. I think it's just well, it's a purely aesthetic. It's, yeah, it, like it actually, as far as songwriting goes, it doesn't make a difference. No, it's, it's 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 purely a notational thing. It's purely how we put those words down on paper. Yeah, I think it's just more yeah, a, a sort of visual frustration. Yeah. Also, like like I, I think my brain just needing a kind of order. Yeah, like oh okay, if these two things are are inherently changing the meaning of each other, why can't they just be together? You know, or whatever. Why can't they just be together? Why can't they just be together? It's like Romeo and Juliet. It's that space between living and room. It's just, it's just, it's, it's just too much to cross. They yeah. are star crossed. <laughs> star star crossed vowels, phonics. Yes, yeah, star starcrossed is a is a compound word, but it's a hyphenated one, right? Like star crossed yeah. wouldn't stick together without the hyphen. Yeah. What's the deal with that? What is the deal with that? <laughs> what is a movie and a TV show that you've seen this week that you want to talk about? Uh, what's a movie? Watched uh, Howl's Moving Castle for the first time. You were so, you're right. That was the first that time was you the first saw time it. I ever watched that movie. Strange Which, movie. Yeah, I, 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 as a kid, I always thought it was beautiful. I think as an adult, it's a bit more confusing. It is a bit more confusing. I'm not sure what I was supposed to take away from it. It's the kind of thing that I'm sure if I like spend some time on Reddit and like had someone else do the work of like picking through the symbolism, I'd be like, oh, that's cool. I mean, there's something about curses and young It's about love. beauty and aesthetics. Yeah, and, and, and like youth. But there's also like, it's really anti-war in a kind of vague way. I don't know. I It, it didn't like... As a kid, it blew me away. It's As a kid, beautiful. It's, be- it's, it's like, a it's beautiful just mesmerizing. Movie. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, the visuals are mesmerizing. And the music. Yeah, the music's, oh man, Joe... My man Joe Hishiyashi. I'm pretty. I'm. I'm going to assume he did the music for that. It sounds like him. TV show. Uh, I just finished Fleabag. That's been on my list for a really long I'm time. I'm so glad that you watched that. Yeah. It was one of those things where we we just finished watching Run, which I just want to say Run is a great it's show. Great. Go New watch show on it. HBO. Don't look up anything about it. Just watch. Just it. watch it. Just throw it on. Mary Weaver and Dom Hong Gleason, uh, Vicky Jones writing and directing and creating. Oh. Fee Roller Bridge executive producing. It is just fantastic. Uh, I have been reviewing the episodes on Watching Lion, which on uh, on Medium, if you want to check out my review of it. Yeah. But instead of reading the review, why not watch it yourself? Just watch it. Yeah, it's, I think it's, it's a new HBO show and it's great. But after we watched Ron, I'm like, yeah, everything Phoebe Waller-Bridge touches is gold. You should watch Fleabag. And you pretty much finished it in like two days. Yeah, I pretty much binged it. It's a very bingeable show. It's it's really cool. It's really beautiful and and tense. It's a it's yeah. It's a beautiful story. It's dark and humorous in a way I think only the British can pull off. Uh, it breaks the fourth wall in a really cool way. It like innovates. It in, yeah. It innovates the way breaking the fourth wall is brought into the TV. Um, and it's just yeah. It's just it's really naturally written and just really compelling. And it just makes you think about life and sex and death and all the stuff that good art is supposed to make you think about. In that vein, we kind of went on a few baller bridge kick and started watching Killing Eve together. Killing Eve, oof. And that, I think we like made it through. And this is, I mean, you know, Fleabag is a 20 minute per episode show, but like Killing Eve is like 45, is 45 minutes. Minute? Yeah, we're- <laughs> we, I think my favorite part about watching it with you is that we did not talk between the episodes. Yeah. Like we just let, just let, it, let it run. Like there was not, there was a silent agreement that we would only finish watching when one of us was like, yeah, I'm going to sleep. Yeah. Like we, we weren't like, oh, do you want to watch like another one? It was like. No, it's, it's no, que- like there's no <laughs> question as to whether or not you want to watch another episode of this show. It's whether or not you should get like it's a, like a not, full yeah. night's sleep. Yeah. It's so good. <laughs> it's so compelling. And, yeah. She, you know, she writes, she created the show. She's, she writes a whole bunch of the episodes. It is such a great show. Sandra Oh is amazing. Jodie Comer is amazing and yeah. chilling and terrifying. Oh, man. And like the music supervision on that show is oh, top notch. It's just such an amazing show. Uh, that is, I think, on Hulu. Yeah, it's on Hulu. Yeah. It's a BBC America show. It's a BBC America show. So, yeah, we've been just more or less this week on a Phoebe Waller Bridge kick. 
Um, we watched the play. We watched the flea play. We watched play. the flea bag play. It was really interesting. That was great. Maybe yeah. nostalgic for the theater. And just going out and I think and just doing yeah, go, I, gatherings of fifty plus people. I got sort of anxious like watching uh, the flea bag play because you know she's talking about going out. She's talking about interacting with people. I'm like wow, like when's the last time? <laughs> I, th- I think it's interesting that that the the one piece of content that doesn't actually depict people doing normal things is the one that made your brain go there. Yeah, like wa- just like watching like Better Call Saul didn't make you feel that no, way. No, no, no. It was it was the idea. I think actually, if I sat and like watched Fle- like rewatched Fle- Fleabag with you, I probably like the show. I would have felt similarly. But mm. it's the fact that like what Fleabag is is her learning from experiences with other people. Mm. And what I love about especially what they harp like what they really play on she's talking to this guy joe he's like hey joe what's the problem and he goes uh you know just people and she goes uh oh yeah i hate people and she's like no no no. it's that they don't realize that people is all we got i think that that line and then how it sort of plays into the entirety of like the feeling of fleabag fleabag is her like learning learning through her interactions with people yeah you know whereas you know i feel you know, you could say the same about Better Call Saul. You can say, but it's it's such a world outside of day to day life. You know, it's like Saul becoming Saul, whatever. Like that's a totally different world. Whereas Fleabag feels like our world. Fleabag feels like our world, and the lessons she's learning are lessons that I feel like we're also sort of grappling with. Yeah. You know, sort of realizing that part of this like quarantine is like a stagnation of like an education. Yeah. You know, which is a very cold way of sort of putting it, but. But essentially, yeah, you are like there. There are mistakes that we should be making right now, yeah. <laughs> or things to be learning, or you know, we've already learned a lot of lessons, and we should be implementing them through friendships and dating and like whatever. And it's just it's interesting how that's all sort of. So I think that's why the show kind of made me anxious. Yeah, I know what you mean. My movie that, that I watched was uh, Never Rarely, Sometimes Always. Oh yeah, which is Eliza Hitman's film. I, I'm a little late on watching it, but. It's incredible. I mean, she, you know, she's always made these really powerful kind of slow burn films. And it's it's a very important message. The way she holds on certain beats is really poignant. The film's getting rave reviews, but I think one of the things I really like about it is just how kind of documentary it feels. You know, the way that it's like, it does feel just like we are watching this person so there's no, so there's not necessarily like a drama or dramatics or like whatever. It's like, like this is life, you know, and this is this is a real struggle for people, and we're seeing it played out in real time and those dynamics. I think it's really really powerful. I also I owe Eliza a lot. I knew her back in New York briefly, but she got me in touch with a guy named Gene Park, who uh, is a sound designer, and he was the one who put me on my first features as a sound editor. And essentially sort of started my career in like film, which eventually led to this and LA and life and everything. So uh, I'm very grateful to Eliza and uh, shout out to Gene, the sound designer, not on that movie, but he did the sound design for Bad Education, which just came out, which I'm hoping that we can watch and talk about next week. But yeah, it's a beautiful film and uh, I recommend everybody watch it if they they haven't already. What's the last picture on your camera roll? Oh yeah, it's an interesting one. I took it today on my morning pilgrimage. I've been trying to I've been trying to drive places in the mornings, like not anywhere in particular, just one practice driving because I there's no, less traffic now and it's the, a better time than ever to learn how to drive in LA. And two, to sort of simulate a commute cuz not having any kind of routine or structure has started to take a toll on my mental health and I'm trying to like curb that by doing stuff in the morning and making, you know, making my mornings feel like they have purpose. And the photo from a camera roll was from outside this cafe. There's a like a, a street sign that just says like a yellow triang- like triangular street sign that says, this movie sucks. And I don't know where it's from. I don't know if it's been there since before the quarantine, if it's just a piece of street art. But there's something really poignant to me about just that sentiment. It feels, it feels very timely to be like, yeah, this movie sucks. This is the darkest timeline. <laughs> so I took a picture of it underneath this like pretty like red uh, tree. Mine was a screenshot of like a Mixmag article that popped up on Facebook that was I sent to my friend who loves you know EDM raves and everything which was essentially the headline was an LA creative studio has designed a pandemic proof raving suit and it's just <laughs> like a, a sort of dummy wearing this ridiculous looking like, like suit oh, like wow. space suit essentially <laughs> yeah, that's weird um so yeah, I so just people took can a, rave I, in peace. People can rave in peace for sure. So I, uh, I I took a screenshot to send to him, kind of like being like, "This is ridiculous," and he responded like, 
I will buy 12. <laughs> um, <laughs> but for anybody listening, if you want to visually see that, check out our story. We will be posting these photos on the first day that we put up this episode. What are your high and your low for, for this past week or past bit? Starting with the low, just to like get it out of the way, I kind of got into a fight with my mom. Oh no. It wasn't like a big fight. We're good. Everything's fine. It was just a small little thing, but I've been growing this quarantine beard over the course of this thing, mostly because what are we going to do? Who am I trying to present myself to? Whatever. I'm just kind of like, but also it's been nice to kind of like lean into a lazier kind of look. And she was a bit critical of it. And I kind of got angry, not just for the comment, but because of like, she's been somewhat critical uh, aesthetically sort of my whole life. Um, she's been critical my whole life of like how I've kind of looked. Yeah, it's a mother's job. Yeah, and I got a Jewish mother, so it just sort of happens that way. But um, it just kind of made me think about like why people decide to look the way they look and how many people probably look a certain way because of how other people feel and how there are plenty of people who look a certain way because they're living their truth. And I think that uh, I, what I was kind of playing at when I was arguing with her um, and what I was sort of defending is that like, I feel like oftentimes we talk about authenticity and trying to put forward a, a level of authenticity. And I feel like part of that is how I look and kind of leaning into what I feel the most comfortable with, even if it doesn't necessarily vibe with everybody else. Because if I, yeah, if I started changing how I looked because of my fears of how I'm like perceived, then I feel like I'd be betraying like my, you know, call to kind of be as authentic as you possibly can. Similarly, I don't necessarily want to go out with or work with somebody who judges my uh, brain and my personality on like my physical appearance. Yeah. Mind you, I'm not going to be like completely disheveled because I don't like that. Yeah. But, you know, a little bit of, a little bit of whiskers or like hair a little bit long isn't going to change my like ability to do my job or be a decent person. And that was something that was just like really frustrating, but a very productive conversation, I would say. But yeah, fighting with a family, especially in quarantine, is definitely going to be a low of the week. And then the high of the week is that over the last couple months, I've been working with my friend Russell Goldman, who we might even have on the show at some point just to talk about film and like creative processes and whatnot. Um, but I worked on a film with him called No Comment. I was the sound designer on it. And... I loved working on this film. Uh, it was a really challenging film to work on, and it was definitely frustrating to work on because there were there were a lot of details. It was a very important. There were very important moments that had to be done right, and I went back and I went back and I went back, which is obviously like you know a process. But when the film was done and actually like seeing it come out, I was really proud of it. The actors in it are incredible. The cinematography, yeah. absolutely incredible. I was just you know it's a short film, but there's a lot in it. And I think I'm just really proud to have been a part of it. On top of that, there's an organization that means a lot to me called RAINN, R-A-I-N-N. And because the film was supposed to like premiere in festivals, but didn't, it just premiered online on um, filmshortage.com and was going to be a link that we'd be spreading around. I talked to Russell about promoting the film alongside a link to donate to Rain, especially because the message of the film is influenced and inspired by the Me Too movement. And not only did he run with that and like talk to the crew about and cast about promoting the Rain donation link, but he also talked to his collaborator, Jamie Lee Curtis, who posted the film uh, alongside the Rain link. So I'm just really, that was a major high of the week. Not just the film coming out, but also having the film be an engine for a great cause. Especially right now during like the, COVID-19 time, they're matching all donations. So it's like double the support for anybody who who does want to donate. And I urge anybody listening who connects with the cause to donate as well. So that was definitely definitely a high for me. Nice. What was your uh, high and low? I think my low of the last period was I, br- I broke my glasses broke. This is really annoying. It was uh, like we were outside and we just hear you scream <laughs> yeah, just, like around the corner. And we're like, are you... All right. I was coming back from a grocery run. My glasses just fell on, fell on the ground and snapped in half. And it was it was a very like it's a it's a very small thing ultimately, but it was very. Uh, there's something about like coming to terms with the fact that without these pieces of glass, I can't like function normally as a person. You know, there's so much of my life that just 
depends on this part of sense perception and then having to 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 go without that for a small period of time was you know an ex- like insult to injury in the time when I'm when I'm already understimulated and less capable of doing things than I normally at am it was it was like an extra I didn't know I could feel any lower than this but this is just like an it's like a little dig under the skin of like well yeah if, if this quarantine wasn't bad enough I also can't see well you were saying like the you know the three things that you enjoy doing in the quarantine is like producing, playing video games, driving around. Yeah. It's like all of those require a decent amount of yeah, <laughs> visual say. ability. Although it was, I, I tried to make some music while I like my glasses were truly broken in half. And it was kind of, it was, it was an interesting test of like how much of my workflow I can pretty much get through without actually seeing the text on the screen. <laughs> like there's so much of it is like muscle memory Do you know your shortcuts? Do I, I, I certainly do at this point. Uh, my high of the week, you know, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I don't know if this is the absolute highest point, but it isn't. When I think about it, it brings me joy. When the you, me, and Meg drove out to the the front of <laughs> of Angeles National Forest to to watch a meteor shower that we saw none of. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it was a light pollution issue. I don't know if it was just the stars were not aligned, pun intended. Uh, but we we drove we you know essentially drove out into the mountains one night at two in the morning to look at the stars. And uh, didn't get anything, uh, but it's still a nice. It was still a nice moment. I feel like the uh, the act of I, I think I think all of the anything I can point to as a high in this time is things like that where where we've been able to just you know band together and just do something. Whether it's like having a meal together or watching a movie together or go, driving out into the mountains and 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 trying to look at stars, but ultimately failing. Well, because it wasn't about it. Well, yeah, it the wasn't, stars. It wasn't it was about, about the, the friends. Stars. It was about the friends. The friends you make, make along, along the way. way. Well, and that's yeah. That that was a really nice night. I, you know, we went out at like two in the morning, yeah. and I think we were just like listening to jazz, and then Harry Styles, and then Toy Story. Toy Story, yeah, yeah. We were, we listened to um, like when somebody loved me from yeah. Toy Story two because Meg hates that song, <laughs> but she was saying that New York was sticky, so that was the that was you know the the that was the, the clash of the titans. That was the clash of the titans. But um, yeah, there was just something you know. I, I was doing like a weird star dance. Yeah, it was just quiet. I remember just like the quiet. Yeah, but also just like laughing. We wanted the stars to do a thing. Yeah, we were just yelling at the sky at two in the morning. At two in the morning. Yeah, that was that was a that was a good day, or a good evening. If anything, it's just a change of pace from the uh, the you know looking at the same gray couch uh, every day of my life. Yeah. Good to yeah, that's it. that. That was the thing. It was like it was air. It was it was yeah. It was a new smell, you know, or whatever. Yeah, and it was really quiet and pretty. What's on your mind? What is on my mind? Same stuff as as ever. Uh, I'm thinking about music and what makes music good and how I can make music good. That's kind of a constant background radiation that's always in my mind. Uh, I guess I've been thinking about esports because I've gotten into Overwatch over over the course of this quarantine. And it's just that's always been something that's fascinated me. But now I have a new perspective on it. Actually, having a a mechanical engagement with with an esport game and just thinking about like. Like why is chess a sport? Like why? Like why do we <laughs> classify these? Like you know, like what 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 is really the difference between a game of soccer and a game of Overwatch? Because at the end of the day, we're watching people, teams of people compete to accomplish an arbitrary goal. But also at like the peak of like that. Yeah, at the skill peak of set. that skill set, and 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 how that like manifests very differently in the physical world than it does in the digital worlds. But culturally, is pretty much the same thing. Which actually kind of brings me to what I'm. Yeah, what's, what's on that, my what, mind? What's on your mind, Nate? Is that uh, you know I'm, I'm kind of manifesting gaming line on this episode because the last episode that we did like this because obviously we did one with the Alexes with the Ugly Boys, but the first episode we did, uh, I mentioned maybe getting into TikTok. Oh yeah. And then I finally kind of bit the bullet like two weeks ago, and it's been really fun. I have been so intimidated by this app. I thought it was, you know, I know so many people who have been intimidated by the app or people who have just like crushed it inherently. And those are also intimidatingly like, how do you just get it? But it's been really nice to like have ideas like pop into my head Mm. over the course of the day Uh, or like scrolling through and being like, oh, that'd be funny to like duet with or like, oh, that would be funny to kind of like parody or like flip or that would just be funny to do 
the same thing they're doing because that's what we're doing is like everybody's kind of repeating the yeah. same thing because that's the the TikTok community. I've just been having fun like coming up with stuff and being like, okay, this is the idea. This is how I'm going to execute it. Okay, I could have done that better. It's nice being like okay at something and like learning it again. Yeah. It's not often that like the learning stages of something doesn't like suck. Yeah. And this has been actually really fun. That's nice. And lastly, what are you looking forward to? What am I looking forward to? I'm looking forward to finishing up the uh, this batch of Sleeping Lion songs that we have in the uh, on the back burner that we're we're compiling our, our quarantine mixtape. I'm looking forward to like having a record of stuff and putting out a record of stuff and 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 releasing like a ch- a bunch of music that people can connect with at once. Uh, I feel like that that's going to be fun. I have you know a lot of my friends are putting out music now and I'm kind of antsy to to join the pool of people who are killing it in the quarantine. So I'm I'm looking forward to that and I'm looking for I'm looking forward to May 15th even though I have a sinking feeling it's not that the whatever ordinance we're in is not going to end then and it's going to get pushed back. I'm looking forward to like the first thing that changes. Like what, I know it's going to be small. I know it's going to be a really long time before the world goes back to quote unquote normal or whatever version of normal we get to out the other end of this. But I'm looking forward to like you can go to a target or something. I don't I don't I don't know what the, I, I don't know what the first step is going to be, but like. Honestly, when I can go hiking, when I could when I could actually go hiking legally, that's what I'm looking forward to more than anything. I think I'm looking forward to finally kind of like tackling some of the more tedious things that I said I was going to get around to. Mm. Like I've been more or less just like trying to clear the slate and clear the slate and keeping busy and everything like that. But it'd be cool to like actually marry condo my room. Yeah. And cool to like finally archive my journals, like get them in a digital form. I know that kind of sounds boring, but I feel like I've just been working and working and working to like chip away at the pile of stuff that we have. And it has taken almost 50 days of the quarantine yeah. to like get there. But now is finally like, oh, like, like here's, here are the things you've really been putting off. Now is an opportunity to actually like interact with that. Also, I don't know. I mean, I, I am looking forward to Rick and Morty coming out and yeah. like all these random movies and TV shows and stuff. You know, I love like just consuming content. And I think I've just kind of gotten comfortable in this space. Yeah. Like I miss, the things that I miss are things that are like really down the line. Yeah. Like I, like you miss hiking. I, I can still kind of bike around the block and that has Scratches hasn't, the itch. That scratches the outdoor. I just want to hang out with a tree. You know what I mean? Like I haven't met any cool trees recently. That's the thing. I've never met a cool tree. Like me and trees, we have. You're missing out. We're, yeah, I get it. You know? You hug them, you know? <laughs> I, I do. I, <laughs> I never got tree hugging until I reached a certain age. And I'm like, oh, I get why that's the, like, it's kind of a pejorative term, but like, I I, I, I get why that's a thing. No, I mind you, I, <laughs> I love nature too. I just like, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I'd love to go visit my grandparents in Colorado because hiking there is like my favorite thing. I don't love hiking in LA because it just has always been a very dry. Death, death defying experience. Yeah. I feel like every time I've hiked in LA, I've either run out of water oh, yeah, that's or true. had a run in with a rattlesnake. Yeah. <laughs> and both are just like, I just don't want to be reminded of my own mortality, you know, while <laughs> hiking. Um, that's like half the fun. <laughs> I suppose so. Well, that's why I like biking. I like the rush. <laughs> you know, I'm like, if I'm going to die, it's going to be like flying over the handlebars, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's really dark. <laughs> But yeah, so I guess the thing that, like, what I'm looking forward to is, like, going to bars with friends. And that's not going to happen for a while. So in lieu of that, I'm just, like, excited for, because the the times I feel the closest to the people in this is when I can, like, call, either when, like, you, me, and Meg are watching something, or you and I are watching something, or when I can, like, call my friends in New York or call, like, whatever, and we talk about the thing that we just watched. Because, I mean, at a certain point, what are we going to talk about? At a certain point, we're not like, day 55, how, how are you doing? Yeah. Same as day 35, you know, same as day 50 when you called. But it's like, okay, I've got two friends that are have two more episodes left of Better Call Saul, and I, I can't wait to get on the phone with them. Because <laughs> we can just talk about that for, like, you know, a half hour. And... I feel close to them and and I feel like we we watched something together yeah. and did something together uh you know since in lieu of going out to a bar or something. So I guess that's what I'm looking forward to. And I'm looking forward to seeing what happens to no comment mm. to that film. I know Russell is always a planner and I know that he if anybody can run with momentum it's him. So I'm just sort of looking forward to seeing I mean selfishly looking forward to having a job but also you know if it does well 
uh, but also looking forward to seeing how one of my closest friends just like grows as a director. Because there's something really fun about watching your your friends just fucking crush. Yeah. <laughs> so with that, I think we can call that a chat. Would yeah. you Would you call that a chat? I would, I would call that at least a chat. Would you call Would you de- define that as a chat? I don't know. I'm not. I I, I tend not to 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 try to define. I, I tend not to define podcast compound word. Yeah. Short for iPod cast? Broadcast. Broadcast. iPod pod, broadcast. Pod broadcast. iPod broadcast. It's a portmanteau. That's when the word for it doesn't mean what it is anymore? No, portmanteau is just when you put two words together. Oh. It's a portmanteau of iPod and broadcast. What's, what, am I, what, what is the thing that I'm playing at? Because now podcasts are called podcasts, but they are neither oh, on an skew-morph? iPod. Yes, it's a skewomorph. Is it a skewomorph? It's sort of a skewomorph. Yeah, it is kind of a skewomorph. It's a skew of a skewomorph. Yeah. Because it's... It's no longer on an iPod, nor is it a broadcast. Yeah. In like the radio sense of the word. And there you have it. There you have <laughs> More it. More English <laughs> bullshit with yeah. sleeping lion, talking lion. More English bullshit with talking lion. Well, thank you to everybody listening. Uh, we hope you will listen to the next episode, which will be our friend Axel Mansour, who very recently was on Songland. And we'll be talking about that. We encourage you to go to our Patreon and help support this show, and also hope that everybody's staying safe, staying inside, and making the most of this very bizarre experience. Until next time, we will see ya, see ya on the flip. around. Mm-hmm.